UN 영어 뉴스 How Magic Mike Transformed the Image of Male Stripping With the third film, Magic Mike's Last Dance, Out Now Anna Bogutskaya reflects on how the Channing Tatum franchise has changed the perception of men taking their clothes off. One does come to a Magic Mike film for the plot until recently. The world of male stripping was not perceived as an aspiration of one. What a particularly deep one. Male strip shows may have been popular, a choice of entertainment among hand parties at all. But the male stripper was seen as a laughable figure within popular culture. You only have to think of hit British film The Full Monty, 1997, whose humor rested on the fact that a group of ordinary steel workers were reduced to taking their clothes off as a result of being in dire financial straits. Nowadays, though, the profession has gone through a complete image overhaul, and that's all thanks to Magic Mike. The multi-pronged franchise, which comprises multiple films, live shows around the world, and an HBO talent show, has single-handedly given the male review a glossy new allure. Last week, the third and supposedly final movie, Magic Mike's Last Dance, hit cinemas. Magic Mike's Last Dance is the supposedly final film, but with the hit live shows, the franchise will continue off screen. At the same time as the Magic Mike Extended Universe has boomed, there's been a notable interest in exploring the dark side of the profession too. With the 2021 blockbuster podcast, Welcome to your fantasy, recounting the true crime origin story behind the uh, Chippendales, the first U.S. all-male stripping trope uh, founded in 1979, who became a national success, catering mostly to female audience. Since uh, that podcast, the story has also been revisited in a four-part documentary, Calls of the Chip and Dales, and given the high-budget glossy fictional treatment with last year's Hulu series, Welcome to Chip and Dales, starring Kumail Nanziani and Moray Bartlett. However, even though the Chip and Dales are still performing to millions of people every year. It's Magic Mike that's become eponymous with the modern male stripper who typically prefers to call themselves a male entertainer these days. The Magic Mike brand promotes female empowerment via hot men and a good night out. And at the center of it is Channing Tatum a dancer, actor, and producer who has elevated the cinematic beef cake into an art form and morphed from the star of the films into the architect of the whole global Magic Mike brand. But what is the cultural footprint of the Magic Mike industrial complex? Is the franchise's appeal as simple as hot dudes dancing, or is it in fact something more profound, a conduit for a positive brand of masculinity? Dr. Bernadette Barton, sociology and gender studies professor 
at Moorhead State University and author of Street Inside the Lives of Exotic Dancers says its appeal really lies in the fact that it's still very noble for us to see male bodies be portrayed as objects of desire. There's also more leeway for male stripping to be celebrated in popular culture. She believes there's less at stake with male strippers. There's less violence, less assault. Not that female customers can't be handsy or obnoxious, but there isn't the same amount. Not that the first magic life film, like Mike film, is exactly carefree. It was inspired famously by Tatum's own background as a $50 a per a night stripper, a detail that was revealed to the world against his will when a strip club owner named London Steel, yes really, the man who had hired him way back in his stripper days, sold a video of Tattoo then working under the moniker of Chen Crawford to US Weekly in 2009. That was the year that Tatum's star was ascending with starring roles in Tito Montiel's Fighting and G.I. Joe, The Rise of Cobra. Instead of feeling embarrassed or denying it, Tatum made a movie about it. The origin story for the film stretches back to a casual beer tattoo. T casual beer tattoo head with Steven Soderbergh after making their first project together. Haywire 2011 when he told him about the nine months he spent as a stripper. Game recognized Game and Soderbergh encouraged the tattoo that it would make a great movie. When asked during a haywire screening Q&A what film would bring him out of his self-imposed in permanent retirement, Soderbergh replied, Channing Tatum's strip per story. The rest happened in a four wind. The script had to be ready to take to market at the Gunners Film Festival in May 2011, and Soderbergh had a small window in August to shoot it. It ended up grossing $167 million worldwide and creating the base for what would become Tatum's Emporium. When we went to make the movie, we were making Boogie Nights or Saturday Night Fever. We didn't really understand that we were making a movie for Winnie said Raid Caroline, screenwriter of the Magic Mike trilogy, Tatum's producing partner and his co-director on Dog 2022 to The Ringer last year, as well as making serious money at the box office. It caused a furrow amongst audiences, said to women and gay men, packed theaters. The audience was reported to be 73% women. The distributor promoted the release at gay pride events around the US and hired dedicated agencies to target and build buzz in gay bars and clubs. Some cinemas even hired go go boys to celebrate opening night. I went to see it twice at the cinema, which was both times packed and vibrating with an excitement reserved for illicit activities. A capitalist parable, whilst the dances and the neatly packaged, somewhat reckoned, reckoned magic mic ethos of empowering female desire have become the global brand's USP. The first film is actually less concerned 
with the either of these things. Then it is with the death of the, um, the American dream. Magic Mike is not really a film about male strippers. It's about financial precarity. When we meet Magic Mike Rain, part two, he's working multiple jobs, stripping being one of them. Part two, worked many old jobs before breaking out as a dancer and actor, including construction, sales at a mortgage company, and cleaning cages at a puppy kitty nursery. Like Ma Magic Mike's last dance is the supposedly final film, but with the hit live shows, the franchise will continue off screen. The narrative thrust of Magic Mike is Mike's desire to leave the stripping behind, to start up his own business, and in doing so, stop working for someone else and work for himself instead. In the film, he calls himself an entrepreneur, but really what he is, is a freelancer in the middle of a recession. Mike's long-term goal is to open his own furniture building business. His sunny, beachfront temp apartment is full of vintage furniture. I spotted two Ms. Van der Rohe and Lily Rake Barcelona chairs, which cost anywhere from $4,000 to $60,000 and of his own creations. A chair, a coffee table with industrial touches that he built himself. Perhaps the least memorable but most crucial scene of the film is Mike visiting a bank to request a loan. He's got his briefcase, his documents all in order, his deposit of $13,000 in hard-earned singles, and is on the charm offensive. In the bank, he's performing acceptability by cosplaying as a serious businessman. Almost comically so, with his rim-framed glasses and beige suit, Despite his best efforts and hard cash, Mike can't get a loan. Like many of Soderbergh's films, Magic Mike is concerned with transactional relationships, or as David Edelstein put it in his original Vulture Review, how capitalism transforms sex into a soulless commodity. Dallas, Matthew Mac Conagay, Mike's mentor and boss, perhaps best embodies this. He is a hardcore capitalist, a self-proclaimed messiah of the male review, loyal only to the dollar. During his solo dance routine, he is positively orgasmic when he is covered in dollar bills. As Edelstein puts it, he is the whole as master of the universe, a universe he built himself. He not only owns the crop, he effectively owns the men who are dancing for him, and most crucially, he owns the dream. His relationship with Mike is a fox mentorship, with Dallas keeping Mike in place by dancing by dangling the promise of an equity stake in the grand 4,000 square feet Miami club that he is planning to open. Magic Mike is one example of a contemporary subgenre that elucidates on sex work and economics. In Hustlers 2019, working class women rob white, white color finance bros who rob all of us. The Girlfriend Experience 2009, also directed by Soderbergh and starring real-life porn, porn star Sasha Gray, explored the world of a sex worker, 
whose income and that of her high net worth clients was being affected by the global economic crisis. The anthology drama series of the same name, co-created by indie filmmakers Lucy Kerrigan and Amy Seymets, expanded on the idea of intimacy as currency, with the first season starring Riley Keogh as a law student turned successful escort. These films and shows, like the first Magic Mike, are cold-hearted and slick, visually rooted in the aesthetics of streets. When Mike quits stripping, it's because of the betrayal of dollars offering equity to the younger, inexperienced, and rash kid Alex Pettifer, who Mike has brought into the club as a fresh dancing with Dallas Dozen Bat on Irish before moving on to the kid as another young, hot property to exploit. Shane Forrow talking about the film in a 2021 episode of the Slate Money podcast points out how equity in the Miami club is just a bargaining chip to keep people at each other's throats and keep them competing with each other so that they are not actually competing with capital. It was capitalism all along. The franchise's evolution, alongside the intended commentary, however, Magic Mike unknowingly tapped into a vast chasm of female desire and voyeurism. In the cinema, women were allowed to look, howl, and thirst as much as they wanted. And once the filmmakers realized who was going to see the film and why, they decided to lean into this. So it was the Magic Mike universe evolved from an anti-capitalist commentary into a bona fide erotic celebration. In the sequel, Magic Mike 2014, Mike, without the magic, now owns a custom furniture making company like he always, he always dreamed. He has an employee and a truck. He's dodging the course of his former dance mates. His silent song, his silent song back into the male entertainment world. Is funny R&B singer Gene Wines on Tempo 1996 sex jam about a man trying to find his partner. Randomly hearing it on the radio leads. Randomly hearing it on the radio leads Mike into an unforgettable sequence of grinding and drill humping in his carpentry workshop. That in turn inspires him to get back together with the kings of temper for one last ride, pun intended. To a stripping convention. One of the understated elements of the first film was the camaraderie and supportive dynamic between the dancers, dancers with the exception of the kid who was a wrong on to, be, to begin with. And the second film develops that further, making them even more endearing. Despite a little hyper masculine appearance, the men of Magic Mike 20L are not insecure about their masculinity or locked into an idea of manhood that's code for misogyny. In all their scenes together, they are at easy with themselves and each other, as is made clear. The performative macho routines and cliched characters like sexy firemen and policemen 
They had been assigned by Dallas, who at this point is out of the picture, having moved to Macau with a kid to start a new show, are still and ill-fitting to their personalities. And so, in the film's narratively minimal but hugely satisfying final, each Tampa King finds their true pony, Tarzan, is a dirty painter. Rico has a sweet shop routine set to candy shop. Ken sings a romantic ballad into a sea of women, and the aptly nicknamed Big Dick Richie consummates a marriage in a sex swing uh, to the tune of Crozier. Magic Michael 20L put female desire front and center, and in doing so, became a much more celebratory work. In one sense, the film is about stripping at work. There is a performance that demands skill and pre preparation. Not just an athletic physique is not enough to look generically hot. It is physically and psychologically demanding. Crucially, however, the sequel throws away any capitalistic dream of a big payday and instead focuses on desire, specifically female desire. The dancer's success is cheaply represented not by the amount of bills stuffed in their songs, but by the satisfaction of their audience. While Mike and the Kings of Tampa are the leads, the film is actually all about horny women, a demographic often neglected and therefore willing to pay whatever it costs to be treated well, as Molly Lambert wrote in a feature for Grantland about male stripping published around its release. Magic Michael 20L identified its audience and then some supervised, super served them. On paper, it shouldn't have worked, says writer and actress Isaura Barb Brown. Barbie Brown, it was so well judged without feeling like it was pushing an agenda. On their road trip, they encounter different women to help them discover the reason they do the male entertaining to begin with, whether it's the green on a gas station attendant's face. After an impromptu performance by one of the crew, or the full-bodied ecstasy of the women being oiled down in the fantastical male entertainer field club domina that they make a stop at. The women of Magic Mike 20L are ecstat ecstatic with glee. There are women of all shades, shapes and sizes, observes Bobby Brown. Their needs are identified and serviced by the dancers, be that by ser ser serenading, air grinding, or some unnameable hip acrobatics, going live, bringing the spirit of club domina into the real world. Magic Mike Live first launched in Las Vegas in April 2017, before arriving in London's West End in November 2018. Since then, it has played in Berlin and toured the US and Australia. When the tickets for the UK production launched, it melted down Ticketmaster, trended on Twitter, and grossed over £1 million in just 24 hours. The appetite for hot man dancing was global. The first time Barbie Brown went to a two-seater show, nobody could tell her exactly what it was. They just told me it was amazing, she says. 
I've never seen anything else like it. It has been so specifically tailored to women. It feels very safe despite the fact that there are shirtless men running around grinding on people. Natas Kapun, who plays the female MC that guides the London show, tells me this feeling is completely designed for an inception. For Channing, it was very important that his creative team was very happily female that would guide him to create this universe. That feels good to watch. Magic Mike's choreographer and the show's co-director is Alison Falk, a long-term collaborator of Tatum's. Nothing can quite prepare you for what's going to happen at a Magic Mike show. The stage incarnation is an extraordinary choreography of bodies, acrobatics, lights, and screams. It's impossible to take everything in one go. In a regular, sh regular, regular show, there's the stage and the audience. In Magic Mike Life, there's the stage, ladder, balconies, plexiglass, bridges, acrobatics, water, and an aerial number. The audience can take pictures and video of everything and anything. Unusual for West End show, Boone's warm, constant interaction with the audience, assures things along, and provides cues for the dancers, who, at certain key points, jump off the stage and into the audience, selecting women to dance with or on before moving on to the next thing. The word strip never gets spoken in the whole show. Boone points out the only unspoken rule is that only women wearing trousers can be taken on stage and that's only to save anyone any embarrassment when they are being lifted up and delicately thrown around by the dancers. The Prosecco flows, the delighted shrieks are deafening the day after seeing Magic Mike Life on the West End. I find a bright red unicorn dollar stuck inside my pocket. It's the fake money given to the attendees to throw at the performers. As for the dancers, they are first and foremost expert performers but have also been selected to fit a sexy but sensitive mold. As Zack Manley, one of the original London dancers, tells this culture after much cajoling from his friends, how much do you have to love yourself to go to Magic Mike audition? He jokes. He initially replied to an Instagram ad that was looking for sexy appealing males who love their mom, which lead to multiple audiences, culminating in an in-depth in -depth interview. Joel Ekperigit, who originally started in the Berlin show before joining the London one, recalls the audition process as unlike anything he'd ever experienced. There were dancers from all over the world who were confident within themselves and with a bit, with a bit of grace to them, he says. Now, with Magic Mike's last dance, the franchise has folded in on itself before the third film was even a thought. Channing once described the live show as the third movie, many says, while the actual third and supposedly final movie functions as a kind of prequel to Magic Mike Life. When we meet Tatum's Mike again, he's pushing 40 and his custom furniture business has 
like many others, been decimated by the pandemic. A chance encounter with Uber Rich, Massandra Mendoza, Salma Hayek, p i n o l t turns into a $6,000 lap dance com sex scene. The power dynamic is quickly established. Mike gets undressed. Massandra keeps her jumpsuit on. He has the moves, but she has the money and so the power. She whisks him off to London and gives him the opportunity to put on a live show that would channel and share the feeling she had when he danced for her. Magic Mike Live has been created with a female-centric team and features female MCs reading proceedings on stage. Tatum has been outspoken about the grueling fitness and nutrition regime needed to maintain the Magic Mike physical. On his appearance on the Kelly Clarkson show last year, he called it unnatural. And in Magic Mike's last dance, he mostly hands over to the trope of Magic Mike live London dancers, now transferring their routines to the big screen. The biggest mistake of the latest instrument, though, is that it takes away any of the delightful camaraderie between dancers, choosing narratively. to focus instead on the b u r g a i n i n g love story between Mike and Massandra. Whilst Mike's buddies Tito, Tarzan, Ken, and Big Dick Rich, who appear only in a quick zoom cameo here, had distinct lovable personalities. The dancers in Magic Mike's last dance don't even get names or a single speaking line. Magic Mike's Last Dance is not a good film, but is a good ad for Magic Mike Live. Continuing the mission set out in Magic Mike 20L and the stage show, Magic Mike's Last Dance is the final instrument in a franchise that has carefully shunned sleaze e in favor of something much more pure, self-acceptance and mutual appreciation. The dancers are there. to appreciate the women who are enjoying watching them. So where does that leave the whole business of male entertainment more generally? The Magic Mike franchise have glamorized and transformed the very definition of the profession while sidestepping the realities of it for other male entertainers, perhaps. The men of Magic Mike are no longer strippers They are dancers. The universe created by Magic Mike has expanded and exploded into real life. Its box office success showing that no fantasy is more lucrative than that of the kind hunk 